Okay, I really got to raise this, but this is my uh, premier event. Uh, in all the years I've been working this stuff, this is the single most important thing I've ever been involved in. This is Antonian Hurak, uh, a Czech engineer with four degrees in engineering, a couple of degrees in business management, speaks seven languages fluently, he a very, was a very bright man. In 1970, I received a call from uh, an investigator with APRO, a friend of mine, and he said, you've got to come out uh, to Denver and talk to my neighbor and listen to this story because uh, this investigator knew that I was a cave explorer and uh, into the physical evidence thing. So I went out, and uh, the wife and I, and we talked with him extensively. He maintained during World War II a diary, daily diary, and it's the best reading. I mean, it's better than anything you've ever read uh, in very great detail. This was, uh, this, this is his home, was his home, in the uh, North Czech Republic, uh, which was then called Bohemia. And this had been in the family for, uh, oh, a long, long time. They had a lot of... Uh, uh, property, they had timber, they had uranium mines. Uh, Tony sold the first uranium specimens to Madame Curie in the uh, early 20s. And uh, very, very wealthy people until the Nazis decided to take over uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, in 1970, I was looking at these sketches and uh, in his home, and I photographed them directly from the diary. This is two pages. And um, I was so caught up in this story that uh, I called Alan Heinick, and he met Ginger and I in uh, Las Cruces, and I showed him what I had. And then he flew up and talked to Tony. And we were so impressed that we decided we have got to mount some kind of expedition. And so uh, Jim, uh, through Jim and Coral Lorenzen, uh, Jackie Gleason agreed to fund my first trip over there. That would have been in 1970, and unfortunately the Russians had just invaded Czechoslovakia in 68, <clears throat> and we had four contacts that would get me supplies and so on, and the Russians arrested all four and killed them. So that kind of killed the expedition. It was far too dangerous. Now, uh, let me tell you very briefly of what happened to this guy. Uh, when the Nazis took over, they took everything they owned down to his wife's wedding rings, put him in a concentration camp. He was there from 39 to 41. He escaped in 41, uh, escaped to Slovakia, and joined the Slavic Underground Army. He was then an army captain, and he had a battalion of 184 men. They were in a heavy firefight with the Germans. All of them were killed except Tony, Martin, and Yuri, and they were left for dead, and Martin with very serious wounds. A sheep man comes along the next day and finds them, treats their wounds, built a stretcher, and took them up into the Tatra Mountains to his cave. The cave had a very small opening, and it was closed up with rocks. The sheep man removes the rocks, they go in, and it turn, opens into a very large uh, entrance room, and here he's going to hide him from the Germans, and he starts going through the holy rites, blessing himself, the cave, and everyone in it, which Tony found kind of unusual. And there was an opening going on back at the end of this room, and he said, please don't go back in my cave, because it is haunted and very dangerous. And so Slavic left and Tony got his rifle, torches, and a carbide light, which I have out at my table, um, and went on back in the cave, which is what I would have done. And after going about two miles in the cave, I'll show you through his close-ups of his sketches. Um, he's coming through here, and at that area, he comes into a long, level corridor. At the end of the corridor is a crawl space. He comes through there, and his view right here of this open or this wall right here. This is 25 feet across the room, and it's about 30 feet high. And 
This is the height of a man, to give you some reference. So from this point looking here, this is what he saw. And what he's seeing is exposed black, satiny, mirror-like material. No seams, no rivets, no anything. And it is framed by very large cave formations. And if you know anything about caving, those formations take a few years to form. Well, right through here, he can see a crack coming down. And where it meets the cave floor, it's just big enough, if he gets naked, he can go through the crack. And if you've ever been in a cave with all those rocks, you don't want to do that. But as he slides through the crack, uh, he can measure the thickness of that outer wall. It's seven feet thick. He gets through the crack and he rolls down the floor to this point here into the back wall. And what he finds himself in is a large structure that goes up right here, the outer wall, the inner wall. So it's like a vertical shaft, 16 degrees off of vertical. And he could never determine, could never get enough light to find the top. And uh, he goes back to the camp to get more supplies, doesn't tell Yurik or uh, Martin about it. And every day he returns a couple of times to this to survey it, to study it, to try to get samples. He fired his military rifle at this point on the wall to try to chip a piece off, and it didn't even scratch this material. And he found by digging right here that this is a limestone accumulation, drippage. And he went down through five feet of this stuff, which means about 6,000 years. Beneath 6,000 years of limestone, he finds the skeleton of a prehistoric cave bear. He takes three of the teeth, which I have, and uh, after the war, he went to uh, a museum in Uzerod, Ukraine, and the curator identified them as prehistoric cave bear. So what we're talking about is 6,000 years of limestone, a cave bear that's been dead at least 50,000 years, perhaps a million. Beneath the cave bear, it's lying on a curved, wavy grill. And I think, yeah, this is how that appeared. And it went on down, and he thought he could feel heat, so he put his ear and cheek to this grill and there was considerable heat coming up to it. And far, far below, he can hear what sounds like a turbine engine. And uh, you've got to remember, this is an engineer. This guy, and he had been directors of mines, very familiar with subterranean sounds. So it becomes really interesting. What are we dealing with? This is how the thing would appear from above. That's the configuration of it. This is that outer wall, the crack in the room. And he said, without question, these are constructed mathematically curved walls. And um, so he's, he's sitting inside this thing, writing the diary, doing the sketches, and pondering what it might be. And the last thing he wants to see is tomb robbers getting in before scientists. So. On the cave map, which he gave me, when he came out the last time, they were going to rejoin their uh, unit uh, in Kosiska, and they had been in there for seven days. Um, he decided that he would obstruct the cave passage where it became crawlways in three places so tomb robbers could not find the artifact if they did find the cave. And without the map, you would never find this thing. And as I say, fortunately, I have the map. This is uh, Dr. Heineck and I in our meeting on the uh, artifact. He then went up and uh, had a long visit with uh, Tony. And they were both from Bohemia, so they hit it off very well. My first trip over there, uh, there's not a great selection of, of uh, rental cars. This is going through village records. This is a manuscript uh, about a crash of a circular object into a mountain very close to the mountain the artifact is in, in 1663. And um, this, is, this is the area. It crashed in this area here. And the villagers from a tiny village went up and 
carried pieces of this thing down and buried them in the village. And I didn't know this on any of my trips over there, so that's now on my to-do list. And guess who that is, struggling to breathe. This is the area of the cave. That's the Tatra Mountains, a la Google. That's the cave area in the Tatra Mountains, which looks like this. If you're standing at the, uh, the cave site, this is what you see looking, east, north, south, and west. For a young 45-year-old guy, it's a pretty good trip. Now this is taken from inside what I believe may be the cave. If it's not this one, there are two more, and it is one of the three. It's taken inside looking out. Uh, high moisture, which gives you all that fogging. Some collapse in the floor from aerial bombing uh, in early 45. These are uh, some carvings, and the JF is Yurik. And I wouldn't even attempt to pronounce his last name. This uh, Martin, the uh, severely injured soldier, was placed in an alcove. Rocks were heated and placed under him to prevent uh, chilling. And we found about 40 feet of uh, 1940s bandage in there, which I brought back. We found this, and this is basically a calendar. And when you sketch that out, it makes more sense. 23, they went into the cave on October 23rd. Um, this, I believe, is part of the, uh, the cave passage. And then Antonian Hurok. And um, I don't know, it may be a stretch, but it's, it's really interesting. Uh, well, I won't have time to go into this. There is another, or there are two more of these things, possibly. One in Oklahoma and one in um, uh, Ohio. And they were discovered in 1867 and 1928. And this is a signed testimony of the witness, one of the witnesses from 1928. Um, I've been in touch emailing with uh, a Russian, two Russian scientists, and they found ancient manuscripts from Siberia where a large black cylindrical object, curved walls, came out of the sky and landed. And this was eons and eons ago. And uh, it made a terrible noise. The villagers, it was so tall they could see it from miles away. Each day it got shorter. So when it finally disappeared, the villagers hopped on reindeers or ATVs, whatever they had back then, and went to the area, no object, but there was a crescent moon-shaped chasm that went down uh, and they have not found the bottom of it. Out of this is coming an electronic signal, pulsing every two seconds. They found another one in Yugoslavia, same pulsing. My second trip, when I was close to the cave, the uh, compasses started going crazy. I put them on the ground with an EM field meter, videotaped them as they pulsed every two seconds. So there may be three of these things. And uh, believe me, it is a fascinating thing. And so my goal is to get back over there before the blizzards start up this year. And um, to help fund this, <laughs> I am hawking CDs that I've made uh, of the, where all the unusual lights and cattle mutilations and so on. That's called the Marley Woods. Uh, I have the 10 best physical trace cases. I have the Tatra or the Cave CD, uh, a Ghost Light CD, and the Cato Landing CD, the full report, all the photos and sketches. So I've never been one to hawk or sell anything relating to this subject because I think it's a little demeaning to the subject, but unfortunately, uh, I want to get back to this thing. So I thank you very much. Thank you.